we have an unidentified flying object. I'm Jack Osborne, and you're listening. This is Hudson Harvey, and you're listening to... I'm Richard C. Hoagland, and you're listening to... I'm Art Bell, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. We have an unidentified flying object. I'm Art Bell, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio... Welcome back to another episode of Dr. J Radio Live. Of course, you heard several friends saying the name of the show. That's right. I am your host, Dr. J, co-hosting with me live in the future by a day, exactly eight hours to be, in fact, where it's 3.01 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time, in, live in London, England, in Great Britain, United Kingdom. How cool is that to say is my good friend, Johnny Webb. As always, we have a super special show for you today. This is a guest since last May. You guys have had given me several requests to bring back. And finally, we got him back for you. If you've seen all the social media accounts, and I'm talking about several, everything from Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Flickr, Tumblr, YouTube, you name it, you know exactly who I'm talking about. If not, let me just give you one second to ponder who it is while I talk to you about last night's show. I truly hope everybody enjoyed Foster Gamble. That's right, Foster Gamble, the founder of the Thrive Movement, who was on last night, and he will be speaking this weekend along with his wife Kimberly, Richard Dolan, Catherine Austin Fitz, who you, you, you will hear live right here this Friday night and so much more. All you have to do is go to my website, drjradiolive.com that's drjradiolive.com and click on the link where you see all their little pictures and that will take you straight to the website of how you can attend that event now tonight we're going to be talking about some really important history history that is not written in any mainstream books history that even in the 70s and 80s 90s even even today Every, every time I've attended school and anybody who I've known attended school who was taught American history or history about World War II was told a lie. I, I've always believed Hitler never committed suicide, that he escaped. As a matter of fact, the FBI even tracked him down all the way to South America in the 50s, and then they lost sight of him. Now, if you recall from last May, our special guest told you exactly where he was hiding out. And without further ado, I would love to bring him on. And that is the one and only Mr. Peter Lavenda. Peter, welcome back. Thanks very much. I'm glad to be back. It's always an honor to speak to you. You are so full of information. And that's why last time we ran out of time. And I'm sure we're going to run out of time again this time tonight. And so that's why I'm going to have to bring you again and again and again. Now, since the last time we spoke, you've actually written two new books, which, like I said, after break, I wanted you to talk about all of them that are out there available for everybody to purchase. But I, if you don't mind, why don't you give everyone a quick little rundown about the two latest book, books, Hitler's Hitler Legacy and Tantric Alchemist. Sure. Well, the Hitler Legacy uh, probably is the third installment uh, of a number of books I've been writing on the Nazis in general. Uh, my first one was on Holy Alliance, which was published back uh, oh more than 10 years ago now. Uh, then I followed that with Ratline, and then Hitler Legacy uh, brings it kind of up to date. Hitler Legacy focuses on the influence that uh, the Third Reich had and the Nazi ideology and, and Nazi personalities had on the development of uh, terrorism. Uh, we're, everybody's talking about terrorism these days. They're, they're you know, fascinated by it. They're afraid of it. Uh, they're, they're assuming that it's all Middle Eastern terrorism or, or quote-unquote Islamic terrorism. What I did in Hitler Legacy is I really went down, I dug deep into the history of terrorism in a modern, let's say, 20th century and 21st century terrorism and demonstrated that it has its roots in the same ideology as the Nazi party did and that a lot of the people who escaped at the end of the war we, we opened up by talking about Hitler. Uh, some of the people who, the other people who escaped, uh, Otto Skorzeny and Hans Ulrich Rudel and uh, uh, so many others, 
uh, who were members of the SS or who were otherwise war criminals contributed to the rise and to the growth and to the training and the financing of terrorism. And this is, uh, this is what Hitler legacy is about. Let me ask you this. Jim Mars, when he was on, not this last time, because he had a new book about uh, basically corporate takeover. I don't recall the name of the book. It's actually being shipped to me as we speak. But that's what he talked about, the rise of the corporations. And in it, he even talks about uh, depopulation. But one of his books, and that's what one of the topics we spoke on on one of the several shows he was on, was called The Rise of the Fourth Reich. And just like you, he said that Hitler never committed suicide. It was staged. And as you know, the Russians, when they recovered apparently Adolf Hitler's body, when it was tested, wasn't it even shorter than what Hitler was supposed to be uh, in height, really? And on top of that, wasn't the gender of the skeletal remains wrong? Oh, certainly. I talk about that in Ratline. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, if you had told me Hitler, you know, never committed suicide, uh, in the bunker that he escaped and he was living in Argentina or something, I would have just raised an eyebrow and said, yeah, right. Um, I never really bought into that back in the day. Uh, I wrote a lot about the Nazis, of course, I, in an, A Holy Alliance uh, and in Sinister... Hello. Yes, you seem to have dropped off a minute. You were just about to say Unholy Alliance, and then we lost you after that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. don't know what happened. That's okay. Um, so, yes, uh, I wrote about it in Unholy Alliance. I wrote about uh, what had happened, how I came to the understanding that the whole story we've been told about Hitler's suicide was a British intelligence operation. It was called Operation Nursery. Uh, the man in charge of that was the man who would later become M, you know, the famous M of the Ian Fleming novels, uh, the head of uh, British uh, uh, intelligence, um, MI5. So you have basically a, an order that came down at the end of World War II to Hugh Trevor Roper, the historian. And Hugh Trevor Roper was told, you have to go out and prove that Hitler committed suicide uh, in the bunker, Right. That's the story you have to tell. You've got three months to do it. You can interrogate only the prisoners we have in custody, meaning the British. You can't talk to the American Nazi prisoners. You can't talk to the Russian Nazi prisoners. You don't speak German. No problem. You've got three months. Prove that Hitler committed suicide in the bunker. That's the story that we have to put out. Okay, now, and that's what he did. The problem with that is, as you know from even the Nuremberg trials, Hermann Goering, uh, I thought that was really actually, th this is a little uh, side note, he, when he got caught uh, by the Allies and was sense, uh, brought to Nuremberg to face trial, he allowed them to be caught with the first cyanide capsule which had been hidden in coffee. And then later down the line, literally hours before he was to be hung, he had a second cyanide pill, which was apparently hidden in a cream, and he had used his influence over people to get Lieutenant Jack Wheelis to provide him with that, ex with that cream so he could retrieve the cyanide. But the point that I'm getting at was all the top Nazi officials were given cyanide capsules in case they were caught so they could avoid torture to be, so, so they can kill themselves rather than div divulge secrets. Am I right? Well, that's right. Himmler died that way, for instance, when he was captured. Now, what other Nazis do you know of that did the same thing? Because obviously, at the Nuremberg trials, Goering was their number one boy, a golden boy. That's what they called him, Hitler's golden boy. But there were several others that never even made it to Nuremberg because they had committed suicide or evaded capture. Was it a little bit of both, I would say? Well, there was a little bit of both. As I say, Heinrich Himmler uh, did bite onto a cyanide capsule and kill himself. Uh, he was trying to pass as a member, a lowly member of the, of the German uh, police. 
uh, not understanding, not realizing that the German police were also on the list of war criminals. Uh, when they arrested him and they began to realize this was Peter, you're still there. You're a little quiet now. We End can't. Of the war. There you are. Okay, got you. Now, why do why do you think they used cyanide in the sense like why just not? Uh, I don't know. I guess that would have been the fastest way for them to commit suicide, uh, so to, to not to divulge secrets because the Nazis had a history of torturing people to get what they wanted out of them. Sure. Now, let me ask you this. Are you, do you believe or buy into the Admiral Byrd story, or is that just a myth? You mean the... the, the um, Operation High Jump. The High Jump operation. Well, I've, what I have done is I have you know, looked at that very closely, and I've written about it, and I've talked about it. The, the thing that bothers me about Operation High Jump, number one, this is just after the end of World War II, we are exhausted as a country, we're exhausted financially, uh, we're exhausted economically, we're exhausted in so many ways. Um, and then for some reason, uh, you know, we send an entire flotilla, an entire convoy of ships down to Antarctica because we're conducting some sort of, you know, experiments down there. Um, we don't bring enough equipment with us to do the experiments. Um, we're, we're wasting lives and money and ships and, and oil and all the rest of it. We're doing all this stuff, and it doesn't seem to have any real purpose. You know, I mean, there's just no, no, no it, it makes no sense whatsoever. We're, we have the Marshall Plan that we're, it's getting underway. We're going to rebuild Germany. We're going to rebuild Japan. We're going to do all of these, these great things that we need oodles of cash for. And yet we decide to spend all this money and all this time at a time when the Cold War is about to begin, and we send a navy down to Antarctica to, I don't know, look at penguins. It, it does sound preposterous. You know, one thing I, I have to say is when I was studying economics in my undergrad before I went on to graduate school and then law school, I was told by an economics professor, they said, what's the best way to fix a nation's economy? And everyone had different suggestions. But she ended up correcting everyone say, start a war. The reason being is we will use all the country's resources to build munitions. We will you know, pay from everything from the soldier's salary to their uniforms yeah. down to the toothpaste. Bomb the, the heck out of the country, then go back and rebuild it, so, kind of like we did Japan. Sure. But that, that is not the right way to do things. I mean, killing people to make profit. Uh, but then again, at the same time, this goes back in history for uh, centuries, if not millennia. Well, you know, the funny thing you should, you should, funny you should mention that because when I was in my economics class in high school, uh, circa 1967, I said exactly the same thing uh, to my economics teacher. And he freaked out. You know, how can you say such a thing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, of course, it was the 60s, right? It was yes. peace and love, you know. Before uh, Vietnam, yes. Well, well, it was, it was during Vietnam, really. I mean, I, I, I became 18 the following year, and, and I could have been drafted. That's another story. But we had, you know, we were on the verge of all this. And, you know, I'm saying this is what we do. You know, we had the Great Depression in the 1930s. Everything was, was going to hell in a handbasket. And, you know, guess what? World War II comes along. <laughs> How convenient was that? So, yeah, it's a very cynical point of view. Um, but there's no avoiding the fact that, you know, the, the military-industrial complex, as, as Eisenhower pointed out, is really running this country, you know, and it needs a war. It needs to be in its state of constant war. I and this idea of constant war was a Nazi concept that was taught to Hitler when Hitler was a young guy trying to have a, his, his a coup, his, his putsch in, uh, in, in Berlin in 1923. He believed in this. His, his teacher, you know, Ludendorff, was, was one of the guys who invented this concept that you know, states need to be in a state of constant war. That's the only like, natural you know, state for a country to be in. Uh, and we've just, you know, we're trying to, on the one hand, saying, no, it's not true. But on the other hand, you know, our actions are speaking louder than words.
I, I'm glad you brought up 1923. That was actually, uh, of course, Hitler's coup, and at the same time that Hermann Goering was uh, injured by a stray bullet. And, and this is the crazy part. He allegedly was rescued by two uh, Jewish sisters who, I guess, nursed him back, back to health. And then when the Nuremberg Laws came into effect, which uh, literally was anti-Jewish in every way, what he did was he made sure that they were once they were put in concentration camps, they were removed con from concentration camps under his orders because they had saved his life. And he also insti in put the rule in effect that anybody who had served f in World War I for Germany was also to be removed out of the uh, concentration camps. But nonetheless, uh -huh. it was still a an amazing, a a amazingly high number of people that were killed. 50 million people were killed by this man and all the armies invested. Seven alone from my family, uh, w not from concentration camps, but from actually fighting, which is really a disgusting thought. Now, I'm going to tie this into it. We actually have what everyone in the world can probably say about the 20th century is the wickedest man who ever lived, Adolf Hitler. But at the same time, the UK calls Aleister Crowley the wickedest man who ever lived. Why, why would they call him the wickedest man who ever lived when in fact Hitler was responsible for invading all these countries and literally being the catalyst for all these deaths? Well, that's a very good question, and I think it points directly at, you know, a major flaw in human understanding and in human reasoning in general. I think to the British, uh, who are, you know, labeling Crowley the wickedest man in the world, um, in, in an era, as I pointed out in, in Unholy Alliance, Okay, we are bringing right back with Peter. He uh, seems to be having some internet issues. I don't know why. Let's find out. Let's see here what we can do about this. All right, everybody, hang by. We got so much more to go on this topic alone. And trust me, we will not let the show go because we have an awesome running show tonight. Very awesome show for that matter. Just hang tight everybody while we bring him on. He is off right now, but let's see if Mr. Lavende is back. Ah, let's see. He is busy. Is he trying to call us back? Let's find out. Everybody stay tight. Aha, Mr. Levende, it seems that we keep losing your stream, but even the UK stream is fine. So I have a feeling someone does not want your information to come <laughs> yeah, through. really. This is the strangest that it's ever well, been because my internet connection is fine. It's just... Let me give you an example. Uh, twice in the last five years we've been doing this, when really important information came out, uh, someone seemed to be messing with things because as you could see, there are several people here, one of them being across the pond, one being in your own state, and they're staying on. When Senator retired now, now retired Senator Mike Gravel was on, he was talking about election rigging. What do you think happened then? <laughs> he was <laughs> knocked off the stream, but nonetheless, it's time to wake people up. You're not going to hear this information on CNN, Fox News. This is why we use alternative media to reach millions of people globally. 
And that is why this is so important. So regardless of these small little tech issues, which I don't think is anything to do with you or, of course, our network here because we are running at a very high uh, uh, bit rate. But I think it has to do with some intentions. But nonetheless, we're not going to let that happen. We're not going to let your information be suppressed. There so you go. Let's continue on, Mr. Lavende. Where were we? <laughs> oh, we, we were we were talking about, right before you got cut off again, where it showed that you were uh, uh, getting cut off, we were talking about uh, the wickedest man who ever lived labeled yes, that. exactly. And the, the real wickedest man. Well, yeah, we, we I, I think the British, and I think people in general, would look at their enemies, their political enemies, as enemies, as people you're going to fight with, um, you know, uh, there was a time which a lot of people in England thought that Hitler was okay. There was a lot of pro-German and pro-Nazi sentiment in England. After all, King George III was German. Um, you know, there's the intermarriage between the, the royal heads of Europe uh, and the British, of course. The British royal houses was, was absolute. They're, they were intermarried. I mean, there was no, it, it was all one big happy family. Slightly dysfunctional, but happy. Um, and I think, you know, that wasn't wicked. What was wicked was Aleister Crowley's idea of, you know, free love and, uh, you know, well, satanic wait, worship uh, and magic and things like that. This was very un-English and unacceptable. You know, fighting and killing people, that's perfectly British and acceptable. <laughs> you know, uh, invading countries, that's fine, you know. But having sex with somebody you're not married to, oh my goodness, that's, that's terrible. I'm actually really glad you brought that up because the 60s was all about free love, yet it was... A so super taboo in the 40s or in the British times but like you just mentioned it's okay to invade a country to kill people but it's not okay to have free love I mean now uh, look at uh, I believe his name was Alan Turing the one who created yes. the first computer look at that what happened to that poor guy he was one of the great saviors of World War II by being able to decode uh, the Nazi, I guess, uh, crypto communications. That's and, right. And then he ended up going to prison for uh, for his uh, sexual deviations. But uh, again, that that just shows where minds are not necessarily right. Why are is it okay to wipe out someone's life, but it's not okay to allow uh, free love, for instance? Sure. Well, this is this is why we had this this great, you know, tremendous scandal machine surrounding Aleister Crowley. He was tailor-made. You know, he represented all the evil things that everybody had been suppressing. And Crowley was not out there invading any countries, you know, or slaughtering human beings or anything like that. You know, so how could he how could he qualify as wicked? But he was wicked, you know, with a capital W because wicked meant, you know, not really one of us. You know, he was out there doing things that are a little outré, a little, you know, risque, stuff that's on the on the edge of what's acceptable behavior. War is never unacceptable behavior in those circles. So he, he didn't commit that particular sin. The sins that he committed were, you know, completely different. And, of course, the hint of black masses and ritual magic, not exactly Church of England. So he fell into that sort of this, this category of something we just don't know what to do with. And so we call him wicked, and we think that he's just horrible, hor horrible little man, as they called him. Occultism was huge in Nazi Germany. For instance, the yeah. swastika was based on, I believe, on an old occult symbol. I, I know you could probably expand on that. But one before I, I turn it over to you, let me throw in one more thing. Was it Himmler? I'm not sure if it, if it was Himmler who flew to the United Kingdom based on astrological charts to sort of seek a peace treaty and then was captured. I, I could be wrong about the name, but uh, was it him? Rudolf Hess. Rudolf Hess. Hess. There we go. It was Rudolf. Rudolf. Yes, 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 yes. Rudolf Hess. I, I thought that was extremely. Uh, I, I, I want to use the word crazy, but at the same time, I guess if that's where their hearts really are and that's what they truly believe, then for them it doesn't sound so crazy. But if you're in the middle of a war and you're bombing the heck out of a country, killing mass people on a, on a scale that is so hard to fathom. Why would you go privately, if you're a high-ranking Nazi, 
in a little plane and fly over the you know English Channel and you know from Germany to you know, I guess through through France. I'm not sure the exact route he took, but ultimately cross the English Channel to land in England just to be captured. Obviously, Hess's uh, goal was never accomplished. No, it wasn't. In fact, Winston Churchill refused to talk to him. Um, it's a very famous scene when Hess finally does land in England and he's picked up, he's captured, uh, he's taken to the local police station. It's revealed that he's Rudolf Hess. He wants to speak to uh, first the Duke, the local uh, lord that he was trying to, to contact, and then he says, I want to talk to Winston Churchill. Uh, Churchill's aides went in to talk to him and say, listen, Rudolf Hess has just landed in England and he wants to talk to you. And Winston Churchill said, well, no, I don't think I will. I want to watch the Marx Brothers. <laughs> really? That's insane. I'm, this, I'm not making this up. He had a little, you know, home theater. They were running films, the old black and whites of the Marx Brothers, and he was, you know, weighing Marx Brothers, Rudolf Hess. Marx Brothers, Rudolf Hess, <laughs> and the Marx Brothers won. The comedy won over the seriousness of uh, oh, yeah. what was going oh, yeah. on. And so he never did, was never able to, to transmit his story, and he made that flight because he knew there was a strong pro-German sentiment in the country. There was a lot of uh, English uh, lords who were pro-Nazi and pro-German. They thought Hitler had the right idea. And he was trying to, to make common cause and say, listen, we're going to be invading Russia pretty soon. We're going to break the Hitler-Stalin pact. Operation Barbarossa is on its way. I want to make sure the British don't you know, get in our way and maybe would help us to go and fight the communists. So there was a political agenda, but it was, as you say, timed according to astrology. Now, astrology was very, very popular in Germany both before, during, and, and of course after the war too. So astrology had this, uh, this power. Uh, a very famous German astrologer had written Hitler's horoscope and basically predicted great things for him until about 1945 when he really had to be careful because things were going to go against him. And this was published in the German newspapers. And Hitler was very aware of it. Now, not just Germany, but in the UK, we have Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote the Sherlock Holmes series. He was deeply interested in astrology and would constantly go to mediums to speak, I believe, to his dead son. And he had a friendship with uh, Harry Houdini, who ultimately, uh, they became, I guess, adversaries, if that's a polite way to call them, or uh, a mean way to call them, because even though they were friends, at the same time, Houdini was doing everything he can to take away from the mediums, uh, to, to debunk them. Why? Because uh, apparently what happened to Houdini, when he lost his mother, he had went to a medium himself, and she had told him a message from his mother in English. The problem was, Harry Houdini's mother never spoke English, so he knew right there it was a, a, a hoax, and, and she was a phony. So obviously the occultism, astrology, all of that doesn't just go back to Germany as we know, it also ties back to the United Kingdom. Okay, everybody stand tight. Let's fix this again. Let's see what is happening. Okay, don't hang tight. Don't worry. We are doing good here on Super High Stream. It's Mr. Lavende who is having some problems. And I think this is intentional to knock him off the show. Obviously, things are working very well. Uh, let's see here if he's going to call in real quick. Uh, we were just about to speak about Harry Houdini and the history of occultism and astrology, that it played a role in not just Nazi Germany, but in the UK as well. Now if any of you doubt that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had anything to do with occultism, 
do some research and you will see that Harry Houdini ended up being his worst adversary. And nonetheless, I think that was the craziest thing. Mr. Lavende, obviously they want to suppress you. We're not going to let that happen each time this goes <laughs> this on. This is the weirdest thing I've yeah. ever encountered in years of doing Skype radio. I, I don't know what's going on here. I know. And like I said, we have another person in Florida on this and another person in the UK on the same one. And, you know, we're all on Ethernet. It's running perfectly. I just think your information is so accurate that somebody out there doesn't want us to hear it because as you know see the difference between conspiracy theory and conspiracy is one takes it from theory to fact and a lot of your research is not conspiracy theory but is actually proof of conspiracies that's one of the reasons why I enjoy speaking to you so much because the information you bring is is not so hard to fathom but yet at the same time it is so earth shattering to the beliefs that people have held for decades if not centuries and beyond now I don't know if you caught the last question or you were about to answer before I just saw that it was uh, struggling to capture just you on and like I said if you could see ours our side you know we're all fine uh, again we're all connected here this is an international show we, we do get international questions and callers but nonetheless uh, were you able to capture what I was able to say near the end I don't think I was. You, you okay. went silent suddenly and ah, I didn't know what happened. What I was saying was, is obviously the astrology was important to the UK citizens as well because of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Yes. Yes. And so we have that going on in the United Kingdom and of course in Germany. And so obviously it was important to both of them. And I guess would that have something to do with the rise of Aleister Crowley and how he became so involved? in Satanism and uh, the Black Mass, which I've read. Uh, I, I was curious one day to, to see what the Black Mass consisted of. And it was really scary. I mean, candles made of baby fat. Uh, I mean, this is the stuff that's in movies, yet this is what was written, things that were you know, happening as early as the 16th or 17th century, 1600s, that I was able to read back. Maybe you were able to go back even further, but nonetheless, Having such a thing would easily label you as one of the wickedest men in America for, for doing that. <laughs> you know, I could see that. Yeah, maybe. Now, so what do you think about what we were saying with regards to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle? Well, it's true. I mean, Conan Doyle and Harry Houdini, I, I caught that part. You were talking about their sort of alliance in going after fake mediums. I mean, Conan Doyle was not you know, particularly uh, a credulous person. He did realize there were such things as, as fake mediums, but he also believed that spiritualism was real, that there was a reality to it that Houdini simply didn't believe or didn't understand. So the, the, the hard-nosed skeptic of Houdini who understood magic, he was like, you know, like today we have James Randi, you know, trying yes. to prove all psychics yes. are wrong. I mean, Houdini was sort of in that category, a magician who, because he knows, you know, a stage magic, believes that all spiritualism is fake. And then you have uh, Conan Doyle, who lost his son during World War I. And uh, he was desperate, and he thought that he was I occasionally in contact with his son, and some mediums were able to tell him things that only he would have known, or his son would have known. So he was, he was less skeptical than Houdini. So you have this you know, this growing kind of interest in spiritualism in England, particularly in Victorian England, but then leading up into World War I and into the 1920s and 30s. You had the Golden Dawn, the Hermetic Order yes. of the Golden Dawn, the very famous British secret society that went through several incarnations over that same period of time. And then you had all the German occult lodges. Now, Crowley was a member of a number of German occult secret societies. The most famous, of course, is the Ordo Templi Orientis, the OTO. OTO, yes. Yeah. And that was a German lodge. That was created by Germans. Um, and some organizations split off from it, such as the, 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 order, the Saturnine Order. Frater Saturnus created his own order. Uh, he was a member of the OTO, another German order. And there were a lot of you know, members scattered throughout the Golden Dawn because the Golden Dawn itself had its origins in Germany according to the, the manuscripts that gave birth to the Golden Dawn. So it all came out of Germany. The Golden Dawn did, the OTO did, uh, and then Crowley sort of took the ball and ran with it. Um, but that didn't mean that the German orders collapsed, because they didn't. They were still 
in existence when Hitler came to power in Germany. Now, with regards to the Golden Dawn, I, actually, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think there's a Masonic link to it. And the reason I know this is I, I have a good friend, uh, a lawyer I practice with, uh, whose firm we were intended to start together, but he got a little head start, so we just worked together. Point I'm trying to get at, he's an atheist, and because he was trying to look for connections, he joined the Masonic, Masonic Lodge, the closest one to him. In the Masonic Lodge, he had met someone who invited him to join the Golden Dawn. Through that, he ended up joining the Temple of Set, which I'm sure you know is a sure. break-off from the Church of Satan. But going back to Golden Dawn, to then the OTO, I'm Greek, so I understand the word Thelema. That is what Crowley founded, as you know. And Thelema, the actual translation in Greek is I want. And if you really look at the nine satanic sentiments and all the things that these uh, satanic occult groups or, or whatever you want to call them uh, use, the word I want basically means, uh, you know, do what, uh, what's the famous saying that Alistair Crowley says, do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law. The point is, is do whatever you want and there's no consequences. The problem with that is every action has a reaction yep. and a, and right. and can therefore if you're doing something against somebody obviously you may be hurting them you know how how can you be doing something how can you be doing whatever you want without on some level causing harm to others whether it could be economic or literally physical you know i hate to use the word rape but you know thelema basically describes that i want this i'm going to take this yeah, I mean Crowley went to great pains to try to explain what all of this meant, and and other authors since then have also tried. It doesn't necessarily mean do what you want because you, as an individual, are not spiritually advanced enough or insightful enough into who you are to really know what it is you want. You're operating on instinct as opposed to will. Uh, Crowley's was a, was a great believer in, in in the will, in finding out what your true will is, uh, and that's that's of a different order than your, you know, your sort of instinctual responses to things. It's a different order than, you know, hunger, greed, lust, and that sort of thing. It's a different, you know, thing entirely. So do what thou wilt in Crowley's system means first you have to find out what it is you want uh, before you can want it. And that sometimes could be, you know, a long process that could take you years of trying to find out what that is. Uh, like a, like a, a series of psycho psychoanalysis sessions or therapy sessions before you actually reconcile various warring factions within yourself to identify that core, that solid core, which is the will, which is your true nature. And once you've found that, you have to do what that is. You have to follow that will because to do anything else would be itself a kind of murder. So what you have to do is find out what that true will is, and once you've found it, you're like a machine that just runs, um, and then you will just you you will just move right along, and you will accomplish what it is that you have to accomplish. Uh, and will people be hurt in the process? You know, um, we're great believers in this country in the free market economy. I hear that phrase mentioned many, many times. And a free market economy means that there are winners and losers. You know, capitalism means, you know, I, I'm winning and you're losing. At some point, there are people who are going to come out on the short end of the stick. Uh, we haven't really fixed that problem yet. You know, we're trying to through various kinds of programs. But basically, capitalism means I win and you lose. Someone's going to lose uh, if somebody else wins. So, in, you know, we're using resources now. We're using the natural resources on the planet. Uh, the more resources we use for ourselves, the, the, the fewer resources are left for others. So uh, this is a problem that we have. It's a contractual problem, you know, a transactional problem that we have with other people and with other cultures and other countries. Uh, I don't know what the short answer is to that, but perhaps if every country found its true will and followed it, everything would be fine. <laughs> Now, here, here's something that's crazy, and I didn't mean to go into the supernatural realm, but it, it sort of ties into this. In 1904, over a three-day period, Aleister Crowley was in Cairo in, in Egypt, and he said the book of the law, where the famous saying that, or his quote, uh, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, is the, the premise of it, which I've read that book, and it doesn't really make sense to me at all, uh, you know, talking about uh, knew it, uh, star, this and that. I have read it a couple times. It's a very, very short book, by the way. Nonetheless, 
at the same conference where I had a fantastic time hanging out with you, uh, Richard Dolan had a presentation where he showed a picture or a drawing that Aleister Crowley drew of the creature, if I'm not mistaken, was Iwas or Iwas, A-I-W-A-S-S, that dictated the Book of the Law to him. Now, he said, R Richard, Richard Dolan, said that when he originally drew that picture, the being had large black eyes. And according to Richard Dolan, friends and family of Aleister Crowley said, if you want people to believe that this being dictated to you the book of the law, the eyes need to look more human. So he allegedly erased the large black eyes and made them look human. Now, when you look at a drawing of I Voss, he already looks like what would be considered today a modern day gray alien. So I thought that was really compelling what Richard said, although there's not there's not really evidence to back it up. I, I think it was just more of a speculation, which I think was a fantastic speculation, but uh, do you think that's possible, or do you think that's just uh, something that... Because Al Aleister Crowley was known for being on so many drugs. He wrote about it, uh, he, you know, how many drugs he was on, what he was doing, and how he embraced them, and how they helped him in his magical rites. So very well could have been a hallucination, and it could have just been his own mind speaking to him, and he thought he was seeing something when, in fact, there was nothing really there. But on the other hand, do you think there's any uh, credence to what Richard Dolan says that I Voss could have been a gray alien? Well, there's, there's a bit of, of confabulation taking place here, I think, um, with all due respect to Richard Dolan, whom you know, I know well and you know, admire greatly. I think that the drawing he's referring to is the drawing of a creature called Lam. L A M. Ah, yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know where I was came from, but whenever well, I was 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 the person who dictated the Book of the Law. That's true. Okay. The, the I was connection to Book of the Law is is, is absolute. Um, there's no doubt about that. Uh, in fact, Crowley at, at eventually began to identify I was with a Sumerian uh, priest or perhaps a, a godling of ancient Sumer and, or, and Babylon. So uh, he began to develop like a very detailed kind of uh, biography of this guy, at least in his own head, uh, who Ivas was. But Lam is a different creature. Lam came about as the result of another magical working, which took place in the 1920s, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, this is after the Book of the Law. And he, was, he had this very strong presence, a uh, very strong uh, uh, effect that he had on Crowley and the people around Crowley that, you know, inspired Crowley to create this drawing. And it is. I mean, if you look at the, the diagram of, of the, the picture of Lum, and you match it with any picture of a gray alien, in fact, the one on the cover of Whitley Strieber's book, Communion, mm -hmm. if you just take that yes. drawing and compare it to Lum, they're almost identical. That's right. That's right. I, I don't mean to interrupt now. I got two questions that I've actually bypassed for the last few minutes. Uh, these are two... Okay, let me read them in order. Uh, the, I'll read them and then you give the answer and then I'll read the next one. Okay, the first one is from Sarah in Brighton, England. Uh, has Peter found any... Is it Alan or alien connection with the Nazis and... Uh, says, okay, I guess alien, it's just spelled wrong. Alien integration with his work. Does he think aliens are demons like Crowley, Crowley's lamb? Oh, that's interesting. Um, the alien connection to the Nazis is something I, I don't, as far as evidence is concerned, and I think, Dr. J, you know how I go about things. I really need a lot of documents before I go out and say something. Um, I don't speculate that much. The, the, the the kind of scientific work that the Nazis were doing, some of it was space-based, as we know now, alternate energy-based as well. There seems to have been some conscious idea that there was some sort of alien presence in the world of which they were aware. Uh, Hermann Oberth, uh, one of the Nazi scientists that we eventually, uh, not a Nazi scientist, let's put it, a German scientist, uh, that became involved in our space program, uh, said on one or two occasions that he thought that a lot of our technology was coming from space. Uh, Werner von Braun made a remark like that at one point, uh, too, and he was a Nazi uh, scientist. Yes. So yes. there might have been some kind of, of awareness on the part of the Nazis where there might have been a connection like this, 
Um, so it, you know, it's a possibility, but I haven't, you know, I haven't seen anything that I could just that I could take to the bank. There's a, been a lot of speculation, and I think some of the the writings of people like Joseph Farrell, uh, and people like that who've been doing the research into the Nazi era, are uncovering pieces of what might have been some kind of direct connection. There was a famous saucer crash, you know, in Bavaria, Ber Berlin, uh, 1936, right? Black Forest, right? Black Forest, yeah. So you had, you know, you had you know, UFO awareness in Nazi Germany. And 36 was in the heart of, you know, the Nazi period. So you have this awareness of, of UFO technology, of the possible presence of, of aliens. You have the famous ghost rockets in Sweden right at the end of the war, uh, which they thought were, you know, might have been Nazi experiments taking place or the Soviets had got them, but it turns out it was none of that. We don't know what they were. So there was this connection. There was a UFO connection to Nazi Germany. But for me, it's still a little tenuous. I'm working on it, though. You know, the great thing about this show is because we are an international show, we get calls from uh, South Korea, South Korea, Cambodia, uh, UK, uh, South America, everywhere. Uh, and there's several chat rooms, uh, many that I don't even know about. And fortunately, there are a lot of volunteers that are monitoring them. I'm going to give it to my co-host, who is now almost four in the morning in England, London, England, to ask the next question. Go ahead, Johnny. Hey, good evening, Dr. J. Good evening, Peter. Um, good evening. This, quick, this question comes from Larry on Facebook, who's in London, and he asks, what does Peter know about the blondes found in the remote villages in South America, specifically Brazil? Are there any connections to Hitler and these German-speaking tribes? Very good question, because there's been a bit of that uh, lately. I've been trying to follow up that story. There have been uh, skeptics who say there's absolutely no relationship whatsoever. Um, and then there are people who are giving some pretty good evidence that the blondes that were discovered down there in those remote villages uh, may have had connections to Joseph Mengele. Uh, Mengele, as we know, spent a lot of time in Brazil. Uh, he was finally found, as far as we know, his body washed up on shore uh, off the coast of Brazil. He spent a lot of time in Paraguay as well. Uh, and he continued his experimentations, not at full force the way he did during the, uh, the Holocaust, not as he did at Auschwitz, but he did continue his experimentation. He kept his notes. Uh, he worked on genetics when he could, uh, genetic uh, experimentation and testing to some extent while he was down there. In the book uh, that I just came out with called The Hitler Legacy, I sort of examined some of that uh, story, what happened to Mangala, what he might have been doing. Um, I found a, an address book, uh, like a little telephone book, a handwritten book, kept by an aviator, Hans Ulrich Rudel, which has a lot of data in there about Paraguay and Brazil and Argentina, uh, Mengele's location and Klaus Barbie's location and all the rest of it. These people were hobnobbing, in some cases, with the intellectual elite of those countries. So you had people like Mangala who at some point you know, would be living very quietly, living sort of undercover uh, anonymously. But at other times, he was traveling quite well, and he was making connections with people like Otto Skorzeny and Rudel and the other people, uh, the other famous Nazis who were raising money and creating an Odessa kind of network uh, throughout the world. So Mengele was part of that at times. He had financing sometimes. He was being financed by his people back in Germany. His family was, sent, was, was aware of where he was living. They were aware of him all the time. There was no mystery you know, to his family in Germany where he was. So this, uh, you know, Mengele could have been operating, uh, creating these types of experiments down there just out of curiosity, just when he had you know, some spare time when he wasn't running from the Israelis who were probably still looking for him from time to time or from other Nazi hunters, um, I think that he did conduct some of his experimentation. They were definitely, uh, Odessa gave him a network of personnel that he could have uh, borrowed from time to time and certainly financing that he could have tapped into again from time to time to further his research. So I think it's a definite possibility. I wouldn't rule it out at this point. I've read what the skeptics have had to say about the, uh, those towns, those villages in, in Brazil, and it's not very convincing. Their, their reasoning is not that convincing yet. To someone like me who's traveled in those parts of the world, it, it does seem like it could have happened and it could be likely. It's interesting because we've got another call comes in and it reminded me of when, bef before we spoke, the last show you was on, we talked about uh, being a member of a certain church, an American church, and this question is from Oscar in German, and he asks, 
What is Peter's take on the current Pope regarding the Black Pope and the White Pope? Uh huh. Yeah, this Pope being a Jesuit um, is a Black Pope, basically. The head of the Jesuit order is usually referred to as the Black Pope, and the head of the, the Vatican Church, I mean, the head of the actual Catholic Church, is the White Pope. Well, in, in, uh, in the current Pope, we have a combination of the two. I, I wouldn't call him a gray pope, but we have a, com we have a black and white pope. Um, on the one hand, we have a man who uh, is held in very high esteem, as we all know, around the world. On the other hand, he spent a lot of time in Argentina during a very dark period of that country's history uh, in order to survive and in order to keep his, uh, his, little, his, 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 his group safe, the, the people that he knew. There had to be a certain element of collaboration with, uh, with the Argentine generals. Uh, during the time. Um, I, I don't see how it could have happened any other way. And the model that he had for that, of course, was Pius XII um, in, in during the, the time of Nazi Germany, who had been instrumental in keeping Catholics safe by basically palling around with Nazis um, and by, by you know, not interfering so much in the Third Reich and in trying to find you know, common ground where he could work with the Nazis, especially where anti-communism was concerned. And, of course, he, he worked very well with them after the war in, in, in making sure that many of the war criminals escaped. They were never prosecuted. They got out using his churches, his monasteries, his rat lines. So you have that example from World War II of the head of the Catholic Church enabling um, some of the worst war criminals you know, the world has ever known, the true wickedest men in the world, to escape to Latin America and the Middle East and other places around the world. So that was the example, and I think that's the example that, that Francis saw, you know, while he's in Argentina dealing with a very similar circumstance, because the time of the generals in, in Argentina was a very, was a, was a horrible time. Um, this was, you know, I wouldn't say it's tantamount to, the, to uh, the World War II, to Nazi Germany, but it was close. Uh, Perón was a, you know, in, in those years, previously, you had Juan Perón, you had Evita Perón, they were very pro-Nazi sympathizers, pro-fascist primarily, pro-Mussolini uh, sympathizers. They worked with Odessa. They worked to help the Nazi war criminals escape to Argentina. So you had a culture in Argentina with a large German presence and a large Nazi underground presence that was making itself felt not only in Argentina but in Bolivia and in Chile and in Peru and in Brazil. So there was a culture there, you know, uh, Francis may be backpedaling from all of that, maybe he had very little to do with that directly, but in the culture in which he came up, he came up in a culture where, you know, people did make concessions to evil in order to survive. And it may be that he made similar concessions in order to keep his people safe, in order to keep his church from being shut down, uh, maybe in order to keep himself, you know, from being killed as well. So, if Francis today have been Francis then in Argentina, I don't think he would have survived. Johnny actually has a follow-up. I just want to give you a heads up. We're going to take a break in about uh, five, six minutes or so. Go ahead, Johnny. Yeah, it was just, uh, Peter, you, I, when I watched a few of your documentaries, I found it fascinating how you found yourself in this church and uh, all the people that were coming in and out of the church in that sense. It was the American church. I forgot the full name of it. But can you tell us a little bit about that story again so we can sort of get our listeners to understand what happened? Sure. I'm a New Yorker, so I'll talk fast. Um, the name of the church was the American Orthodox Catholic Church. Uh, it was a church that was set up in the Bronx, of all places, which is where I'm from. And this church was created by a Ukrainian priest called Walter Profeta, or Vladimir Profeta. He created this church as a kind of anti-communist excessively, you know, extreme right-wing kind of organization. And his purpose in this church was less to bring the gospel or preach the gospel anywhere because none of that was happening uh, when I was there. The purpose of this church was to act as a front for intelligence operations. Now, I didn't know it at the time. I was 17, 18 years old when I had made contact with the with the church, with the American Orthodox Catholic Church. But when I did make contact, I was there at the headquarters with Profeta, 
with the other bishops around him, and I saw a lot of really strange stuff taking place. They were moving people in and out who had no religious training, no religious background at all, and they were being given documents making them bishops or priests or, you know, uh, archbishops and all kinds of stuff. All kinds of things were going on of that nature. We had a Nigerian guy come over during the Biafran Civil War, and, you know, Biafra was the Catholics were supporting Biafra in those days. This guy was anti-Biafra, and we made him a bishop and sent him back on the plane almost immediately. And he was accompanied by people from the Nigerian uh, uh, consulate in New York City. You, we had agents moving in and out all the time, and I kind of I lost track of them. My story is very long. I won't get into it. But then when the House Subcommittee on Assassinations is investigating once again the JFK assassination and they're doing this in the mid 1970s you know I start to hear these inklings that maybe some of the people that I knew in that church were coming up in these investigations but I had no hard evidence and then finally uh, when I was writing Sinister Forces in this century um, I started to to make contact with some of the old bishops and I found out from them that yes our church was a front our church was a front for intelligence operations and Hoover had to approve all new uh, uh, ordinations or consecrations of priests and bishops J Edgar Hoover of the FBI so this is the kind of stuff that was going on and I finally found confirmation of it only about six months ago when I got copies of the documents from Jim Garrison's files out of New Orleans and he has letters in there from the church that I was at only months before I got there concerning David Ferry and Jack Martin the two of the famous co-conspirators in the Jim Garrison trial in New Orleans uh, Archbishop Profeta is asking for them back and this is an amazing set, set of documents you know, you've said a lot of fascinating things. I'm sure some is going to have to wait till the second hour. Uh, of course, I want to ask you about the Prospect Church, if you know anything about it. You mentioned the Vatican helped Nazis escape, which is absolutely true. There's a lot of verifiable evidence. This is not a conspiracy theory at all. This no. is a true conspiracy with, uh, you know, as you said, lot of I, lots of evidence. I've heard this from several sources, uh, mainstream sources who don't even believe in conspiracy theories. And uh, also going back to what you said earlier, Werner von Braun, a top Nazi that we brought here gave him immunity from you know being sent to, uh, I believe, the Netherlands or Nuremberg, where the international war, uh, international criminal courts are, uh, just because we wanted his science from the V2 rockets, if I'm not mistaken. And then what you said about Mengele is very interesting. I saw a fantastic documentary from National Geographic which started out that Mengele had there was a lot of sightings of him in Brazil and there was one small village where there was an explosion of twins more so in that area uh, per, in, per ratio compared to other siblings than in anywhere else in the country and possibly throughout the world and they assumed it had something to do with Dr. Mengele but it ended up being that, of course, it wasn't true. Mengele was never in Brazil. Another thing I wanted to mention was, of course, that uh, in in South America, in the 80s, early 80s, there was a, I don't remember who it was that died. He was a high-ranking Nazi. But when his funeral, when he died, and his funeral was actually... Uh, you know, filmed and broadcast on local news. I don't know what country, I just know it was in South America. They were uh, saluting him the same way they were saluting uh, Hitler in, in such a way. They weren't saying Fuhrer, but they were doing their, you know, traditional, uh, you know, Heil this, Heil that. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? The that was the funeral for Walter Rauch. That's and right. It, it took place in Santiago de Chile. Uh, the place where I went, uh, and the funeral was conducted by a man called Miguel Serrano, who had been uh, Chile's ambassador to Austria after the war, an ambassador to India, a friend of the Dalai Lama, etc., etc. He was also a committed Nazi since the 1930s. And uh, when Walter Rauf died, peacefully in his bed, the man who invented the mobile gas chamber, uh, they had a complete Nazi funeral for him. Absolutely right. 
All right, I think we are getting ready to take a break. Let me see if we are going. Let's do it, everybody. Stay tuned. We have so much more from the one and only Peter Lavende, who I'm proud to call a friend, one of the greatest researchers of our time. I'm Mark Bell, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. your mic, Dr. J. Pause, yeah. Professional baseball player Trevor Bell, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. Welcome back to Hour 2 of Dr. J Radio Live. Of course, I am your host, Dr. J, co-hosting with me live in London, where it is now 4.02 a.m. Greenwich, meantime, is, of course, my good friend and co-host, Johnny Webb. As you heard during break and in the beginning of the show, those are several of our good friends that have been part of the shows and, of course, people that I, uh, I'm just friends with. Most of them, actually every single person, including Art Bell, has even been interviewed, not just when I worked for him as producer and associate producer, but if you go to my YouTube channel, you will hear an interview that I did with him Promote it f to, to promote his comeback, which sadly only lasted four and a half months. Nonetheless, we have been having an awesome conversation, and just as I feared, we hit the mid-show break before we can get a bunch of information in. Why? Because there is so much more. The person we've been speaking to is the one and only Peter Lavenda, who's got so much information that I would love to continue to have him back on. I, I think we could spend hundreds, and I mean hundreds and hundreds of hours, and I still think we'd run out of time because there's so many topics that he has written about, that he is knowledgeable about, that I 
am really interested in, and this is one of the true American heroes for what he has done, putting himself on the line by writing so many fascinating books. And I'm actually going to turn it over to our guest right now to talk about the books. He is an author, a researcher, a lecturer. And when I say author, several books, three of them that were sent to me just recently, uh, not including the two that he mentioned at the beginning. So without further ado, Mr. Peter Lavenda, please let's talk about your books, where you're going to be coming up next, maybe some websites you have, anything you want to say. Go ahead. Peter, you still with us? We lost Peter. Let's go ahead and fix this real quick. <clears throat> Let's see here, everybody. Stay tuned. Don't worry. He is here with us. We are live with Peter Lavende. Let's get this going here. I don't know how to fix this. Ready? Let me just try. There we are, Mr. Lavende. I was just yes. talking about all your amazing books and how we will run out of time, and we definitely have to have you back because you are so full of information. We can go on for probably thousands of hours, and I still won't be able to pick your brain for the amount of research you have done over the last several decades. Now, I would like you at this time to talk about the several books you have written, where people can buy them, and maybe any upcoming events, and of course, any websites that you want people to know about. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, as far as website, of course, you can go to peterlavenda.com. Um, from there, you'll find links to other sites that I've created for some of the other books I've done. I haven't been too good about keeping up that uh, the social media these days because I'm immersed in another project, which is sort of all-consuming. Um, and I'm I'm running past deadline right now, uh, so I have to really you know put my nose to the grindstone and finish them. So I won't be updating for a short time, but at least you'll get portals. You'll be able to find out where books are available, and any events that are upcoming, I'll post there as well. Um, people generally know me from either Unholy Alliance or Sinister Force. The Sinister Force is exactly what I received yeah. from trying to AS. Three yeah, of them. Three of yeah, them. Yeah, that's. Right? It's a trilogy. It was intended to be one book, but it was it was physically impossible to get them between two covers. So we had to split it up into three. Um, but that's a project that I've been working on since the 1970s. And it only came out, you know, about 10 years ago, finally, in all three books. Uh, and that's really pretty much analyzes American history from its prehistory period, the mound builder culture and all of that uh, before the arrival of Columbus and all the way up to oh about the 1980s 1990s that that period just trying to tell people just trying to show them look at all the weird stuff that's taken place in our history for which there's no explanation no rational explanation you know all the coincidences the synchronicities that have taken place uh, I just devote only one chapter to the Kennedy assassinations just to show all the weird connections that exist between just a handful of people and a string of assassinations that have taken place in our country. Um, I talk about the UFO phenomenon in the third volume. I talk about the Manson, the Charles Manson family, and uh, the implications of what Manson was doing. And that's pretty much all throughout all the volumes, but in, in a large extent in the second volume. And of course, um, Jonestown and all of that. So it's American history, and it's the weirder aspects of American history. And I focus on it, and I document everything, and I just ask the question, what do you think all this means? Uh, the Nazi books, is a whole, they're self-explanatory. The Hitler legacy focuses, as I said, on the Nazi influence on terrorism. And I've recently come out with two sort of occult-oriented books. One is The Dark Lord, which is about H.P. Uh, Lovecraft and... Alistair Crowley and that whole tradition or between Lovecraft and Crowley and Kenneth Grant, what does that mean? I sort of break it down, analyzing that, uh, telling you all kinds of spooky stuff, the strange coincidences that exist between Crowley's work and Lovecraft's. And then the last, the most recent book is The Tantric Alchemist, which has been a labor of love since the 1960s in trying to decode Western European alchemy. And I do it using Indian and Chinese sources uh, to actually reveal what many of the alchemists were actually writing about. And that's in The Tantric Alchemist. And that came out just recently. This is why you are one of my absolute favorite guests, because you are so knowledgeable. I can't believe you've been working on the Sinister Forces trilogy for four decades. That just goes to show how dedicated you are and the number of books which 
are amazing to read and I hope everybody out there listening and who will eventually view this on YouTube later as our all shows are archived with some cool footage for everybody to see as eye candy that way if you're just listening and happen to glance on your uh, computer or Macintosh or iPhone whatever you're using you're able to see it also for those of you who are listening on terrestrial radio right now I'd like to give you guys all a shout out uh, Mr. Lavenda I know we're going to run out of time so we absolutely are going to have to have you back i'm going to try to fit in as much as information in this last hour as we can now one great thing you brought up first of all let me go back uh, colonel lieutenant colonel dr michael aquino phd when we had him on i didn't want to talk about satanism that actually came about with blanche barton who also goes by magistra barton and she confirmed that several politicians are in the Church of Satan. Now back to Colonel Aquino. He left the Church of Satan in 1975 to start the Temple of Set. He was a member from 69 to 75. Uh, he told me the reason being was because initially Anton LaVey and, and uh, Aquino himself had worked himself up to become a high priest of the Church of Satan. But then uh, LaVey ended up changing tactics, wasn't as much as involved as spiritually as he was uh, worried about, or not worried, cared about wealth. So he ended up tr tr uh, trading things of value, such as money, cars, and other belongings, for uh, priesthoods. That way people can say, oh, I'm a high priest in the Church of Satan. When we interviewed Colonel Aquino, which he's going to come back, he talked about this book Mind War. As you know, he was a professor at the U.S. Army JFK School of Warfare PSYOPs Division, which is te technically, you know, psychological warfare. And he used in his first book Mind War, uh, and, and the reason why he's coming back is to talk about his new book. And in, in the new book, he's going to be he gave me a short rundown of what we're going to speak about when I spoke to him last week. And that was he was going to uh, give his his take on what he would have done during the Cuban Missile Crisis as opposed to what actually happened. Fortunately, we ended up not having a nuclear holocaust, which we were literally on the verge. I don't know how many people are really aware that we were this close to being annihilated by the Soviets. And then, of course, you know, while their uh, atomic birds were on their way over here, we would have sent them over there. So this would have been true world destruction. Fortunately, it was averted. He also wants to talk about how he would have handled Vietnam and the false flag of Gulf of Tonkin. Now, I want to actually talk about Nuremberg. Hitler said, or not Hitler, Aquino said Hitler was a master at mind control. Now, you know this, uh, there's a famous saying, I don't know if it goes back to Houdini or, or who said this, but it goes along the lines of this. What the eyes see and the ears hear, the mind believes. So Hitler said, if you can control all five senses of people, you can either make them extremely angry, or you can calm them down. So his book Mind War is an attempt to end physical warfare, meaning we don't need to use bullets and bombs and kill people, when in fact we can do whatever it takes to calm them down. So for instance, he used, like I said, Nuremberg as an example. You look at all the pomp and circumstance of Nuremberg. You have tens of thousands of troops marching in perfect order. I'm sure if you've seen in Triumph of the Will, uh, that which documented one of the Nuremberg ceremonies, and also the way Hitler spoke. He stood on stage and literally stood there, waited for minutes until everybody in the audience became completely silent. Then he started very calmly and got so worked up where he got everybody motivated. So you have all these troops, you know, in perfect alignment and, and moving uh, in sync, you know, in in synchronicity then you have all these Nazi swastika flags all over the place and then you have all these fires what a great way to 
hypnotize people along with his speech. Uh, what would you say with regards to that? Would Do you think that Hitler was a master of mind control in that sense, that he was able to get? Because if you think about it, coming out of World War I, Hitler was a little loser corporal uh, who couldn't even get into an art school. But yet, you know, f not even two and a half decades later, uh, not even that, I, I think less than that, he had people, 80 million people, uh, you know, at, at least in Germany, uh, when they joined the army and joined the, the Nazis, uh, anywhere from the SS to the reserves, they didn't pledge their life to Germany, Germany the motherland. <clears throat> they pledged their life to the Fuhrer. Who does that? I have never heard of a country, for instance, uh, nobody joins the uh, U.S. Marine Corps, like my brother, who, you know, who served honorably for eight years before he joined the Navy and now is working for a private military contractor, or a friend who sadly passed away after the 2003 invasion in Iraq when he was uh, in the U.S. Army. None of them pledged their allegiance to die in the name of George W. Bush or Barack Obama. They did it for the United States of America. Now, why would people be so, uh, I, I don't want to use the word contempt, but why would they go along with pledging their allegiance and their life to their Fuhrer, Adolf Hitler, unless, of course, he was effectively using the sense, the mind control, controlling the as senses that he could. Obviously, he can't control the sense of, of taste because unless he's feeding him something, but you can control what they see, you can control what they hear, you can control what they smell, and, and I, I don't know if touch was involved, but just those three alone would be enough to either incite a riot or, on the other hand, do exactly what Hitler did. What's your take on that? Well, um, first let me say that I, uh, I, I know uh, Dr. Aquino, I've met him. Um, I think that Mind War is a, is a fascinating book. I think that people should read it to understand about I'm so not actually so glad you, I didn't know you, you met him, so you've actually read the book yourself too. Oh yes, yeah, sure. And I've started to read his new one. Um, so the, the, the mind war concept, the non-lethal weaponry concept, uh, which is uh, part of Aquino's uh, uh, thesis, as well as, to a certain extent, John Alexander, um, also is involved in the non-lethal weaponry uh, uh, research and development as well, uh, who, by the way, is also involved in, you know, has written a book about UFOs. Um, we, we're talking about um, what you've mentioned in terms of controlling sight, and sound, uh, smell, and all the senses, and using that is exactly what is done in a case of ritual ceremonial magic. This is, this is the magician's forte. When you are involved in a magical ritual, if you read the grimoires, if you read the spell books of the sorcerers, the spell books of the magicians, if you just read the books of uh, Israel Regardi's books on the Golden Dawn, you will see that what you do is you create a controlled environment. Uh, if you're going to invoke uh, the planet Mars, which is the example everybody always gives, uh, the color of Mars is red. Uh, there are certain perfumes that are sacred to Mars. There are certain uh, diagrams and symbols that are sacred to Mars. You create a kind of sensory deprivation chamber in which all the senses are basically neutralized except for one consistent message, one color, one scent, one idea, one spiritual force. And that is how magic is performed and operated in the ceremonial, the Western ceremonial tradition. You go into any church, you go into any temple, you go into any mosque, it's an environment that is controlled completely towards one idea. What Hitler did is he took that very basic idea and he opened it up to the Nuremberg uh, Plaza, for instance, where the rallies were, were held, uh, into the stadiums. He, he opened it up so that it became a national religious ritual. Um, and he did this not because he invented it on his own. He understood it viscerally, but he had training. He had training from Dietrich Eckhart, who was this crazy guy, a uh, drug addict, like a, like a Crowley figure, 
that was very influential over Hitler's life. Dietrich Eckhart was able to train Hitler how to talk, train him how to move, how to speak. Uh, he made uh, in, uh, introductions to all the influential people uh, that were around in, in Berlin and in Munich in those days. In fact, Mein Kampf, Hitler's autobiography, the first volume of it, is dedicated to Dietrich Wait, Eckhart. First volume? I didn't know there was a second volume. Well, it's one big book, but there's, it's divided into sections. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. And the first section is d dedicated to Dietrich Eckhart. So I think the second one is Rudolf Hess, if I'm not mistaken, because Hess spent time in the prison with, with Hitler in Landsberg. So you have um, that. Then you have ha uh, Hanussen, who was a magician, a stage magician, but he was also a mystic, a clairvoyant, and a magician, an actual magician, who performed ceremonies for ritual ceremonies for magical purposes, who also trained Hitler how to talk, how to move, how to hold himself, how to control the attention of an audience. So you had two mystics who were very busy in training Hitler to be what Hitler eventually became. Because when he came out of World War I as a corporal, he had absolutely no social skills, no ability to talk to people. He was a fanatic. He was a cauldron boiling over, but he had no direction. Between Eckhart and Hanussen, they honed Hitler into the, into the magician, essentially, that he became. Uh, you know, I've actually uh, got uh, an interesting uh, uh, suggestion. Someone would love out there, uh, he, it's an anonymous person, said they, they would love to have you and uh, Dr. Aquino on at the same time. <laughs> would you ever consider such a thing? Oh, absolutely. Like I say, I, I know Aquino. I think, he's, yeah, I think his, yeah. his books are, are very well. He's a brilliant man. He is. And, and he's well respected in the intelligence community. So he, this is a person that is, you know, is somebody that you should listen to. He sure is. And, and like I said, I, 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 I don't want people to, take the, to get this the wrong way, but he is a friend of mine. We speak uh, at least once every couple weeks or so. Uh, to talk about his books and uh, upcoming things. I had him booked on Art Bell when I was working uh, for as his producer, but Art decided against him. But nonetheless, uh, he is extremely brilliant. And one of the things he wrote in one of his books I thought was super fantastic. Now, I'm just going to paraphrase it because I don't have the text in front of me. And it's not Mind War, but it had something along the lines to say that uh, I don't know which country they were but he said two philosophers from uh, a few hundred years ago said something to the effect that we uh, as humans always respond to stimuli and therefore we're always half awake hence half intelligence intelligent so in order to change that we need to be aware which would therefore once we wake up we'll start to realize more and hence, will our true intelligence will come out? Do you did you ever read that by any chance, or do you have anything along the line of of uh, comment to say about that, or do you know which of the philosophers he was mentioning? I mean, it could have been a number of philosophers. This sounds a bit like Gurdjieff. Uh, yes, to a certain that was one of them. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So Gurdjieff, you know, did say that we are basically all asleep. We're sleepwalking. That's right. That that was the one. Thank you for yeah. correcting me on that. That's the one. Uh, and we're supposed to wake up. The only way to wake up is to stop reacting and start acting. Um, we react. We have a reactive, you know, uh, a way of looking at things. We wait till something happens, then we do something about it. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to wake up and to become aware and not to be so susceptible to things that are going on around us. Um, if there had been more of that in 1933, we might not have had the Nuremberg rallies or any of the rest of it. But people were reacting. They were easily controlled, easily manipulated by someone who understood how people think or, or don't think, basically, how they react to emotionally. Um, political life around the world is, is, is subject to emotional manipulation all the time. It's not a question of people rationally sitting around and thinking to themselves, well, how are we going to fix this problem? You know, it's ideology, it's emotion, it's a bunch of other stuff, but it doesn't actually get anything done because you know, everybody's emotions are in the way. And I think that's what happened. Germany is like the prime example of what happened when this goes really, really wrong. And um, you know, I remember uh, Norman Mailer, whom I, used, I knew very well, 
Um, I mean, uh, not as well as, as his closest, closest friends or anything, but I hung out with him from time to time. And Mailer at one point uh, the, the, said to me that, you know, we're living in a kind of pre-fascist society. He saw us as moving closer and closer towards the kind of fascism that became, you know, uh, dominant in Germany and in Italy uh, in the 1930s. He said, because people are emotional, they are making decisions based on questions of race or questions of religion or all of these things, rather than thinking to themselves, how best can we improve things, right? How best can we protect ourselves, uh, increase our, our standing in the world? How best can we provide for our children, et cetera, et cetera? We're thinking along emotional lines and ideological lines instead of thinking, you know, rationally. And this is the danger, this irrationality in political discourse is what led to the rise of Hitler. Germans were frightened. They were, they were impoverished. Out of work, too. I was just going to say exactly. Yeah. Out of work, impoverished. They were impoverished. They were starving, and they had lost a war. They, they had lost everything. They had lost their self-esteem as a nation. Uh, they were carved into pieces. And, uh, and not to mention the Treaty of Versailles destroyed them. Destroyed them. You know, even forbade them to have an army. Yes. Um, so all of these things transpired and, and conspired in order to turn Germany into what it became. We have to be careful. We don't, you know, we don't get so freaked out over, you know, the economic situation and the political situation and everything else that we make some, you know, bad choices. So this is, I think, what um, what we what Hitler understood instinctively. But he also understood one more thing, and I quote it in the Hitler Legacy at the very beginning, uh, or was it in Ratline, one of my Nazi books? I'm, they're getting all confused in my head now. Um, but Hitler said in in Mein Kampf, he said, "People will believe a big lie." much faster than a small lie. The bigger the lie, the easier it is to believe. That is exactly true. Uh, and again, that goes back to the heart of everything of how you can control people. And when people are at their worst, just like you said, impoverished, uh, the Treaty of Versailles, which really, I hate to use the word, uh, the, the R word, rape, Germany, but it really put them in such a, a poor position uh, that I think... If you were living in Nazi Germany or pre-Nazi, but in Germany post World War One, you would have done just about anything for you to eat, have a job, and live life. Uh, and then, so when Heinrich Himmler, or not not Himmler, uh, who was it that appointed uh, Hitler as Chancellor? Um. Uh, oh my God! His name just just slipped out of my mind. Me too. Me too. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't him. It wasn't. No, it, it wasn't Himmler. Yeah, Himmler was uh, under not under. Uh, it was a. Was it Hindenburg? Hindenburg. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for. Creating. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Hindenburg. Yes. Um, anyhow, I don't want to shift gears without uh, you know going this, but Johnny has a, an interesting statement to say to you, and then I'm going to use that statement to pivot to an important topic which we mentioned in the beginning. Go ahead, Johnny. Yeah, hi there, Peter. Um, the last time we spoke, um, we, we managed to get some more of your time and have a bit of an after show, and we talked intensively about a few things. And in that time, right towards the end of the conversation, uh, I divulged to you that I was actually talking on the shores of Lake Toba in Sumatra, Indonesia. And you was telling me that you'd lived in Indonesia and you had some experiences there. So I just wondered if possible you could sort of tell us a little about your experience whilst in Indonesia and what you've surmised there. Sure, uh, I'd love to. I lived in both. I lived in Malaysia for for seven years. I've lived in Indonesia on and off, uh, months at a time over the years since about 2007 until now. I did business there before uh, in Jakarta mostly, but uh, I spent a lot of time in Jakarta in Georgia, and uh, everybody goes to Bali, and I've been to Bali naturally, and traveled around, uh, you know, central, uh, western, you know, mostly central Java for the most part. Um, I, I went there in 2007 deliberately for three months to Jogja to Gajamata University because it was part of my getting my master's degree in religious studies and, and Asian studies. So I had three months that I spent there. And it was during that time that I came across um, information uh, pertaining to you know, a belief among many Indonesians that Adolf Hitler had survived the war and had wound up living on a remote island in the Arge Indonesian Arch archipelago, uh, which I dismissed immediately as you know preposterous, right? Um, and then later, 
as I found more and more documentation about this, and I was shown you know, copies of newspaper clippings and magazine articles, and enough of the information in these sources, which were very dated going back to the 80s, uh, led me to believe that there was something to that story and that it would behoove me to go back and maybe dig a little deeper in the story. And that is, you know, that got me very involved in Indonesia on the political end, basically searching for Hitler. And on the other end, I got very involved in studying the tantric temples that exist throughout Indonesia, uh, which are fascinating and nobody knows they're there. When I say nobody, I mean foreigners generally are not aware that there's a wealth of Indian religious architecture throughout Indonesia, which is, as we all know, a predominantly Muslim country. But these, these, these massive, in some cases, uh, statues, um, temples, large buildings, uh, Borobudur, of course, is very famous, but past that, some of the other things on the tops of mountains in remote places, I've gone there, I photographed a lot of them, I published them in a book called Tantric Temples. Uh, I, I've just been fascinated by that aspect as well. So there's a lot of mystery, a lot of... S where Indonesia is concerned, both you know, from the religious angle and from the political angle. And in Indonesia, politics and religion and mysticism are usually all combined together as one thing. So this is something that's always fascinated me. And of course, the Hitler story of, was, was very compelling, absolutely. Took a lot of my time. It's interesting because we've got a call now from uh, Peter in, in, in uh, Cambodia who generally rings in and he's asking um, about the Bali bombings and the Semtex being used you know, in the two bombs. Did, did you ever find out any research on that? Um, yeah, there's been a lot of speculation that this, the Semtex came from CIA, that it ah, came from yes. Western intelligence. I've heard that story. I haven't been able to prove that, of course. If I did, I probably wouldn't be on the air right now. I'd be, you know, in uh, you know, some sort of rendition site someplace. Um, so I'm kind of glad I haven't found anything more specific on that. But I've heard the rumors, certainly. And as an aside, I did uh, meet with the man who ordered the Bali bombings, uh, a man called Abu Bakr Ba'ashir, at his Pesantren in Solo in Indonesia. I was part of a small group called Psychologists for Peace, how I got involved in that group, I really don't know. But I was sort of dragged along with this group and uh, was sitting quite close to the man uh, who had actually given the orders for that. And I questioned him about that. Other people talked to him about it. Um, and all we got back in response from ABB, as we called him, uh, was real you know, recitation of stuff that you would find in the protocols of the elders of Zion. I mean, worldwide Jewish conspiracy, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and, you know, I wasn't involved in the Bali bombings, he said. Of course, he was imprisoned for it. But I've given the order, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to do anything that would kill Indonesians or kill Muslims. You know, from now on, our targets are going to be in the Christian countries. So <laughs> he, he, you know, sort of didn't make me feel too much better after that. But what he was saying was, we're not going to kill Muslims anymore. We're going to go and, and kill other people. Uh, he was right there, right in front of us. Uh, we were photographed, we were filmed during this, this, uh, this, this meeting. He claims, of course, total responsibility for it. Had CIA been involved, I'm sure he would have taken that opportunity to, to say so. I mean, I was looking at him face to face and he was looking at Australians and, and Brits and Americans and we were all there you know, asking him very pointed questions about the Bali bombings, about Jama'a Islamiyah, which is the political group he founded, which was a, a sister group of Al-Qaeda. So, you know, and, you know, 9-11 was hatched, people say, in Hamburg, in Germany, but the idea was hatched in Kuala Lumpur, not far from where I was living at the time. So it's, there's a Southeast Asian connection to all of this, which is very strong. So I don't know about that Semtex story. I don't have anything much to offer on it because I haven't seen enough, uh, you know, irrefutable evidence so far to suggest that. And Ba'ashir had more than enough, you know, opportunity to lay the blame on CIA if he wanted to. He was blaming Bush for everything else um, and blaming Americans for everything else. Yeah. yeah, sorry to interrupt you there, Peter, but it's interesting. We've got a lot of calls coming in. We've got one now from um, Reza in, in Iran, in Te Tehran, sorry. Um, and he's asking, what's your views on the recent beheading in Saudi Arabia of the Sheikh? Well, you know, number one, of course from my point of view, it was a mistake um, to do that. Other things could have been done to silence him if, if the Saudis felt they had to. Um, my problem 
is that we're talking about a part of the world uh, that Americans do not really understand very well. And they are not served very, very well by their media in understanding what's going on in the Middle East. We are living in a fantasy world where the Middle East is concerned. So our suppositions about Saudi and their motives and Iran and their motives and you know, uh, Islamic State and their motives and everybody else is a mess. We really don't understand it very well. And in Hitler Legacy, I try to talk about that, try to talk about the blindness we have where this is concerned. I don't think that the, sheikh sh that the, uh, that the cleric should have, been, should have been beheaded. From my point of view, I think it was a mistake. What does is, what, what is Saudi Arabia hope to prove by doing this? You know, do they have a death wish? Do they really want to escalate the tensions in that part of the world? There's other things they could have done, and that's where diplomacy might have you know, been beneficial rather than you know, doing that. By the same token, Saudi Arabia has their own laws. Uh, they have their own laws against conspiracy, against terrorism, against blasphemy, and everything else. I think we have to remember, too, that Saudi Arabia does behead people as an execution. They've been doing that for, since forever. I mean, beheading is their form of execution. Um, we don't really realize that all the time here in America or in the West in general. When Islamic State does it, of course, it's horrific because they film it and then they disseminate that media throughout the world. When Saudi does it, I mean, the Saudis, they do it you know, in the streets and they hang corpses from lamps and everything else uh, in, in, uh, in the capital, but um, it's kind of contained. We're not, really, we're not really aware that this is how people, you know, execute people in that part of the world. And really, in many parts of the world, beheading is still done as execution. So if we extract the execution, the beheading part, and just deal with the execution part, was it a wise move to execute someone like this and to escalate this conflict? Saudi is playing a dangerous game, and they're trying to incite you know, they're trying to create this, this, con this, this warfare between Sunni and Shia for their own motives, for their own, for their own reasons, which have less to do with religion than they have to do with politics and economics, I feel. I'm actually going to change gears slightly. Uh, since we got on the topic of Indonesia, a lot of people, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the show, uh, so many people, for a fact, no longer believe that Hitler committed suicide in 45. Uh, the FBI sure didn't believe it. They were tracking him allegedly to uh, you know, South America. But you were able to track him to Indonesia. And if I'm not mistaken, I think you said he passed away from natural causes in the early 60s. Was that right? No, he died in 1970. 70? Okay. Oh, wow. January of 1970 in the port city of Surabaya, and I went to his grave. Really? Uh, what's, yeah, it, what's it marked, if you don't mind me asking? Well, this is the problem. This goes back to the real story of what I, what I write about in Ratline. Um, there's a, there's a, a whole host of inconsistencies here, which can only suggest something very serious was going on in Indonesia. He died in January of 1970. He would never leave his island retreat. Uh, the man that they believe was Hitler. He was living under the name, if this was Hitler, the name of Dr. Georg Anton Puch. Uh, he was supposedly an Austrian medical officer for the Salzburg Gau, which was a district uh, under the Third Reich. Um, he was, Salzburg, of course, a very famous city in Austria, Mozart city and all of that. He was the medical officer there, uh, which meant that he was in charge of euthanasia programs and all this other stuff. Well, if, he, if, if it is indeed this doctor, the doctor uh, fled Austria, fled Salzburg after the war when the Americans began to realize that this guy was probably, you know, a war criminal. He escaped to northern Italy, uh, to Bolzano, which is where all the Nazis wound up first. That was the first stop on the Underground Railroad, essentially, the monastery route, they called it, uh, going into South America. Um, this is where the story gets very, very strange. According to documentation, and I have the documentation, this guy stayed in Bolzano for years. And that, to me, made no sense at all uh, before he actually left to go to Indonesia. In his documentation that I've seen, he had names and addresses. He knew about uh, Krunoslav Dragonovic, the Croatian Catholic priest who was moving everybody, helping the, the church to move everybody into Argentina, all the war criminals. This was the guy who was running the rat lines. He knew how to reach him. 
He had uh, actually names and addresses of people who could teach him Spanish. He had everything set up to escape, but he doesn't escape, or at least the documents don't, don't show that he did. And then years later, somebody using that passport and that documentation winds up in Indonesia with his blonde, younger wife, right? They go to this small island uh, in the middle of nowhere and called Sumbawa. And in those days, it really was the middle of nowhere. It's still the middle of nowhere today, but in those days, it was really out there. He goes to Sumbawa. He goes in the middle of nowhere, on the, in the middle of nowhere, and sets up a quote-unquote clinic and lives there the rest of his life until January of 1970. In January of 1970, something happens to bring him to this coastal city, Surabaya. He hated to leave where he was living. Documentation shows that he never wanted to leave. He was scared to death to be uh, identified by anybody. So he stayed in this remote place. Married a Muslim woman. The blonde wife left him at some point, went back to Europe. He married a local woman, converted to Islam to do it, because the rules of Islam are such that you have to, if you're a man, you have to convert to marry a Muslim woman. So he marries this woman, and for some reason, must go to Surabaya in January of 1970. By now, he's in his 70s himself. Well, let me ask you, so what happened to Ava Brown? If, well, he, this married, is, if he married another woman, Well, right? we, Well, this is, this is part of the story. Okay. The blonde woman goes back to Europe the same year that Ava Brown's father goes into the hospital and dies. So I'm wondering, was the blonde woman Dr. Georg's wife, a woman called Hella, or was it Ava? You know, did Ava decide to go back to Europe and risk, because nobody's looking for Ava Brown. My, th my thesis in Ratline is, if we only had started looking for Ava Brown, we might have found Hitler. But nobody knew Ava Brown existed until after the war. You know, it was one of the best kept secrets. That's Hitler right. did not want anybody to know he was married. Nobody, yeah. I was just going to say, I, he first of all, didn't he marry her in the bunker? And, in the bunker, the last and, minute. Yep. And his... I don't want to see his idea, but the reason why he never married her is because he always said that it was better for him to be single. So if he was going to be the Fuhrer of Germany and the Third Reich, and if he succeeded the entire world, that an unmarried man should be in that position because a married man would take away the priorities of the country, which is sort of flawed reasoning if you ask me. But it wasn't that how Hitler well, felt? Well, it, it's the Pope's reasoning, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. But he also goes one step further and going celibate. Yeah. 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 Well, Hitler, Hitler wanted to appear that he was still available. So he always had the ah. attitude, right? There was always the chance they would get to meet Hitler and all that. So that was part of his, 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 his shtick, you know, to use the Yiddish but word. Sorry. I also but remember, then, Peter, sorry yeah. to interrupt you, it's Johnny yes. in London. I remember that Hitler was very, very offended by, by the First Lady of America that he felt was quite interference uh, in the president's part over there. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, Hitler was nothing if not, you know, sexist. I mean, he, he really was. Um, but, you know, give him his credit. He was also a vegetarian. So, you know, there you go. Um, oh, yeah, crazy, yeah. But, yeah. But yeah. he was also on a, a lot of drugs from what his doctors were feeding him. I remember oh, yeah. seeing pictures of him in 45 uh, when he came out to greet, which were literally children at the time. His hand was shaking uncontrollably. And then I saw another documentary on National Geographic, which uncovered the diary of the physician Hitler's personal physician which had a, a list of several medications that uh, were injected into Hitler daily including methamphetamine oh yeah that was Dr. Morell and Dr. Morell was a quack doctor he was not a real doctor he was a guy more interested in, in selling his own homemade uh, pharmaceuticals than anything else like snake oil yeah, he was a snake oil salesman. The actual real doctors around Hitler were not really allowed to diagnose him. So Hitler was never diagnosed, number one. Number two, we don't know if the man greeting those small children was actually Hitler or one of his two doubles that were found by the Soviets when they entered Berlin. 
There's the other problem, because was that really Hitler? Hitler went out of, dropped out of sight after Operation Valkyrie in 1944 because he trusted no one at that point. He thought he was going to be killed at any moment. Actually, I'm glad you brought Valkyrie up. For those people who don't know, which I think they'd have to be living under a rock because it was made into a major motion picture with uh, uh, Tom Cruise. That was a fantastic plot to kill Hitler, I believe, July or July 20th, 1944. That's right. Run by, uh, was it Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg? That's right. Yeah, that was a, uh, and that was one of the. Uh, let me guess. I think it was about twenty, uh, twenty attempts made to kill Hitler in his yeah. tenure. Sure, at least. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the interesting thing about that story, since you brought it up, the man who was responsible for uncovering Valkyrie, uh, the man who pretended to go along with Valkyrie, and then in the end had everybody arrested when it failed, was a guy called Otto Rehmer, an SS uh, uh, general. Rehmer survived the war and survived the war only to actually run a neo-Nazi party in Austria, was defeated and narrowly escaped being arrested again, and then became a major figure on the Odessa network for fundraising and everything else. He traveled to the United States. He was invited to speak by the Liberty Lobby in the United States uh, at, at one of their meetings. So here is a man who was an unrepentant Nazi who was trying to influence American politics as well. And there's another story connected to that. We're going to run out of time, so I won't get into it. I'll just tantalizingly say that Raymer was also involved with a man called Keith Thompson. Uh, Thompson was an American Nazi who arranged a lot of these meetings. And Keith Thompson also, parenthetically, was the uh, literary agent and literary executor for Marguerite Oswald, the Harvey Oswald's mother. But that takes us in another direction. <laughs> yes, Please. yes. And so does Ruth Baker, actually, who's another person who, uh, surprisingly, uh, wrote a book that was published by Trine Day. They sent me a giant box of, uh, you know, people they wanted me to put on the show, which in, I was, because I didn't even request books be, by you, because I had already purchased a few. So I was blown away that they had sent me the trilogy, considering I had already bought one myself on Amazon, <laughs> uh, you know, just a few months prior to that. So I thought it was a uh, synchronicity to say the least, because, sure. you know, I was a fan of you for years. And then, uh, you know, I've been doing this radio show for five years under different names. It's It's been Dr. J Radio Live for now a couple years now, but it's gone through several transitions. But nonetheless, uh, you know, you've been on my list for quite some time. And then it just so happened I was able to land you last year. And I'm glad we we're able to form this to continue because as you mentioned we are getting close to time we will definitely absolutely need to pick this up again at another time uh, you know I hope you're available again in the next coming months because people are definitely digging this uh, we are getting you know non-stop uh, uh, messages from uh, I could I know there's about 12 to 15 chat chats that I'm aware of I don't even know how many because people form uh, ones uh, you know I was just told the other day that there was a Dr. J Radio Live fan chat room wow. but nonetheless uh, you know we're getting a lot of uh, amazing stuff from you speaking of which there is another question I believe it's from Johnny go ahead Johnny yeah it's interesting because you know you you, you mentioned uh, you know Adolf Hitler this evening and, and all the things that have really gone on but um, one thing that happened was just that recently that came out was that there was a train full of gold found in Poland in a tunnel. And uh, it, it reminded me of Inglorious Bastards and, uh, and Valkyrie where they were hiding the gold of Germany. Um, have you been able to find out anything yourself about that gold? I know it's gone silent in the last couple of weeks, but uh, what's your opinion on that? Peter, are you still with us? Did you catch that? Oh, let's make sure there's no more. Ah, we lost him for a second. Hold on a second, Johnny. I may need you to repeat it. Everybody, don't go anywhere. We will get this. Aha, Peter, did you catch yes. that question before you uh, got cut up again? Something about the, the gold, the tunnel in Austria. Yeah, go yes. ahead, Johnny. F go ahead and re-ask it. Yeah, sorry, Peter. Yeah, it was about the, uh, the Polish train that was found quite recently, a couple of months ago, yes. uh, in a tunnel, and it believed to have a lot of gold that belonged to Germany. And I, and I remember you were talking about Valkyrie and uh, Inglorious Bastards, the movie, sort of resonated on that a bit, that they were looking for this train. And my understanding has been found. So w what's your opinion on that? 
Well, that's only one of many, I think. Uh, not one of maybe many, but one of several that have, been, that have gone missing. Um, the, the amount of gold and valuables and other valuables that was stolen by the Nazis during the war is, is, is immense. Uh, during the Clinton administration, uh, the president advised, he created a committee to see if they could find out uh, really what happened to all that money because there, were re there was repatriation uh, attempts made uh, to find the rightful owners of the paintings, of, of artwork, of, uh, and of gold and of assets and everything else, and how much of it was in the United States, how much of it was in foreign banks. And they did an exhaustive uh, search of it as far as they could and eventually threw up their hands. They said, look, we're scratching the surface. And they found, you know, uh, hundreds of hundreds of thousands of tons of gold that uh, there are records of. And, of course, the Bank of International Settlements was laundering a lot of that cash through Switzerland. Uh, Goering, since we talked about him, had trainloads of gold and artwork that he was sending out of the country. Some of it wound up in Spain and in Portugal. Uh, as a matter of fact, speaking of Indonesia, uh, 20 tons of Nazi gold, we know, through the actual documents, bank documents themselves, wound up in Indonesia. Another 20 tons of, of uh, Nazi gold wound up in Macau, uh, which of course was, the, was a Portuguese colony at the time, and that 20 tons went into China, uh, right around the time of the Chinese Revolution. Uh, so, Nazi gold is, is a fascination for a lot of people because so much of it was stolen, there's virtually no records uh, that we can rely upon as to where this gold wound up, particularly the stolen assets. A lot of it wound up in Asia. Uh, the Japanese were burying gold as well, uh, all through the archipelago, the Indonesian archipelago, including on Sumbawa Basar, so on Sumbawa. So we know that, you know, there's there's a major connection here to the stories I've been working on, which involves the gold, which involves a mysterious bank in Jakarta, which involves our our friend there. The, the, the Nazi living in Indonesia on that island who died in 1970, and which goes back to the Soviets. Because just to make one point before we leave the subject, the man who died in January of 1970, this old Nazi, an Austrian, the same height and roughly the same age as Adolf Hitler, with a handlebar, sort of, not handlebar, but a Charlie Chaplin mustache, the same guy dies in January of 1970, and three months later, in Soviet Union, Yuri Andropov, at that time head of the KGB, orders that body of Hitler to be dug up from a KGB headquarters in East Germany at Magdeburg. They dug up a parking lot in the middle of the night, found Hitler's bodies, what they claimed was Hitler's body, Hitler, Eva Braun, and the entire Goebbels family, and their little dog too, and took them out and cremated them uh, next to the river Elba and scattered their ashes into the river. This was at the same time, you know, that this mysterious guy is called to Surabaya, is, I think, murdered in Surabaya, in Indonesia. And then shortly thereafter, the Soviets, who have been claiming all along they had Hitler's skull and they had Hitler's corpse, suddenly decide, for no particular reason anybody can understand, to destroy the body they have in their possession. I, I believe there's a connection. I believe the connection has something to do with the gold and something to do with the escape routes. I just don't know exactly what it is yet, but I'm still working on it. I, I don't want to deviate, but I don't want to let these uh, listeners uh, you know, feel like they're not uh, being monitored. Okay, sure. these uh, two questions actually come from two separate people, both from the same country. Uh, the first one is from Connor in Ireland. It says, what are your favorite topics, Peter. It's a, it's a very broad <laughs> statement, but I said I'd ask. Well, you know, as, as you can tell from the books that I've published in the last uh, 10 years or so, I've published, I think, 12 books, and they cover the gamut from American history to World War II to the Nazi underground to terrorism to alchemy uh, to Tantra and to Crowley and Lovecraft. So, you know, take your pick. I, I'm involved with all of this because I think they're all related. And I see it as all parts of one big picture of reality. So my goal really is to try to find out the connective tissue between all of these things, between history and science and mysticism uh, and politics, and find out what that is, because that's really what's controlling our lives. Okay, this is another question. This is uh, Sean Ossel in Ireland. What, uh, let me see if I can read this correctly. What sets you on the path to write real history instead of what the world history taught us? 
Another great question. And what are you guys doing up so late in Ireland? Um, I know the pubs are closed. Uh, <laughs> Well, it's the same here in London. Yeah. Well, well, Johnny, I, I, I forgive you. Okay, <laughs> it's these Irish guys. I don't know where they're coming from. A very good question. I want to answer that. Um, what set me on the path was the fact that through accidents, you know, I lived through some of this. I was involved with that weird, weird church when I was 17 years old. During Vietnam, I could have gone to, you know, to been, been sent to the jungles. All of this was going on, and I'm involved with a church that actually is involved with the people that they claim you know, were co-conspirators in the Kennedy assassination, for crying out loud. Um, I think this sort of got me moving in that direction because I had tangible contact. Uh, my father had you know, some FBI information on him because he had once known Frank Sinatra and thrown him out of his house uh, back in the late 1940s, another long story. But there was like, there's always this tangents, uh, uh, connectivity between myself, my own life, and the things that were going on you know, in the grander scheme of things. I mean, I knew Black Panthers, and I knew Weathermen, and, and people in the IRA, and you, because I lived in New York City <laughs> in the 1960s. I mean, you, you knew a lot of people. You were constantly talking to people, meeting people, uh, underground people as well as overground people, mainstream people. So uh, that plus, you know, a, a fascination with religion, with mysticism. Uh, I studied Chinese, you know, in 1970 wow. or so. I didn't know uh, that. Yeah, I, I had a fascination uh, for studying Mandarin because I wanted to read, you know, ancient Chinese texts on alchemy. So that was when I was a kid. I was still in my early 20s, and I really wanted to learn Mandarin. I went to school for that, uh, and it came in handy when I started doing business in China. So, you know, there, I, I traveled a lot. I've seen a lot of things. I've, I've known a lot of people, a lot of crazy people sometimes, or dangerous people, Nazis, Klansmen, you know, terrorists, people like that. So I think I, I have to write the real history. I mean, I have to write what I see every day because when I tell people these stories, they don't believe me. So I'm forced to write them and show the documents, you know, give the footnotes, give the bibliography, say, here, you can go to the National Archives and find this yourself. Here are the sources. Look it up. You know, I'm not making this stuff up. Exactly. This is why I appreciate you so much and so and so the other guests as well that put themselves on their line, their reputation on the line to do such things. We have another night owl. I couldn't even tell you a time. I guess I could write this person and ask. Uh, this is uh, Yanis, and I know this because that would be uh, translated my name in Greek, just like Juan in Spanish or mm -hmm. Ivan in uh, German, says... Is the Prospect Church the church you're talking about? Unless, I don't know if you missed it the earlier. The pro the pro no, no. The Process Church of the Final Judgment, no, I was not involved with that church. I was involved with a, with a weird Eastern Orthodox Eastern Orthodox Church that was the creation of this Ukrainian, which is a whole other story. But no, the Process Church is something else completely different. But I've written about the process pretty extensively because, um, of course, they were involved supposedly in the Bobby Kennedy assassination. They were involved yes, supposedly with, yes. with Charles Manson. They were involved with Charles Manson. There's no doubt anymore about that. And the guy who incorporated, by the way, the Process Church of the Final Judgment and came up with the name of the Process Church was a guy called Tommy Baumler. And Tommy Baumler was a lawyer in New Orleans out of the same office as Guy Bannister, David Ferry, and Jack Martin. And he incorporated the Process Church of the Final Judgment. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. What exactly. That, uh, what does that mean? You know, but there you go. Uh, Johnny's got another international question. Uh, go ahead, Johnny, and uh, tell him who it's from. Well, it's from Jacob in Paris, and he's asking, um, in the recent Bombly sorry, recent Paris bombings, is it a new world order, or NWO he's written? Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, exactly, I think that w what we've done is we've forgotten some of our history. Those of you who are, you know, my generation, basically, remember what was going on in Europe in the 1960s and the 1970s. You had a wave of bombings by the extreme right who were trying to cause uh, a, a rupture between the West and the East. So there were train bombings, there were disco bombings, there was, you know, the, the bombings in Bologna in Italy, the, the train station, and there were Madrid bombings, and of course, continual bombings in, in the UK because of the Irish question. So you had terrorism in Europe for a very long time for various other reasons. Now we're having terrorism again from a different source. But I think to me, to, to my way of thinking, 
you know, I've gone through this, I mean, I'm 65 years old now, so I've gone through this history for a long time. I'm not seeing anything specifically new. It's a different costume. It's a different, you know, uh, taste to it, maybe, in a, in a certain way. But it's still terrorism. It's still politically motivated acts of terror. Uh, the Ah, you still with us, Peter? We just lost you after political acts of terror. Mr. Lavenda, you went quiet for a mere second. Ah, he'll be back really shortly. Okay, let's get this fixed real quick. He must have struck a chord with real history. Let's see what is happening. Son of a gun. Let's everybody hang tight. Mr. Lavende will be back any second here. Let's go try again. All right, everybody stay tuned. We are coming near the end of the show. Let's see here. It says he is busy. Don't worry, everybody. He is back. Uh, Mr. Lavende, again, you must have struck a chord of truth that violated some people. <laughs> yeah, we are literally so. nearly the end of time. I'm going to let you finish that thought. Last thing I heard was, I believe, uh, something about terrorists and then... Uh, you went quiet. If you could reiterate that statement before we close out the sure. show. Sure. I was just saying that you know I've, I've, we've gone through this before. We, Europe has gone through this before. Uh, we've gone through it before in, in the U.S. We've forgotten the terrorist attacks that have taken place in the United States before 9/11. So you know this is let's everybody calm down and look at this more dispassionately. I don't think this is a new world order that's taking place. I think we're being sold that story because it's what about politically Operation expedient. Gladio. Oh, yeah. How much more time do we have, Johnny? Uh, we're out of <laughs> Don Johnny, if you could just uh, hang by with that. Just go ahead and finish, Mr. Lavenda. Yeah, well, Gladio, that's another whole story. It's a stay-behind operation. Of course, they were funded. They had weapons to create you know, terrorist acts, and some people took advantage of it. There's no doubt about it. All right. You know, I, I wish we had so much more to ask everybody. Uh, join us again. Uh, you have a surprise guest tomorrow, of course, Catherine Austin Fitz, who used to work at the Housing Urban Development, is on Friday, 7 to 9 p.m. Pacific Time, 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern, 3 to 5 a.m. GMT. Of course, all you have to do is go to Dr. J Radio Live. For all of those who who I didn't have a chance to ask your question. I promise next time, join us again early. Ask a little bit early, and I will make sure your questions are asked to Mr. Lavenda. You can also write me at drjradiolive.com. Use the contact button. Send me the question, and I will make sure it gets into Peter's hands. With that being said, I wish we had some more time. But I'd like to thank again everybody for listening. And uh, with that being said, let's get ready and sign out.